It's Some Ryan, otherwise known as a man in his music. And this time around, I'm gonna be doing something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but I just never really got the gumption to sit down, organize my thoughts and information surrounding this artist. Because with him being very underrated, it's very hard to go online and you know pick pieces off of certain websites and sources and put it in the form of a video. So to further aid me, you know, in this video, I created a discography that I've been, you know, working on within the past month. But I've also wrote a tiny essay to go along with this to kind of keep me on track throughout the video. So I'm going to be referring to what everything that I've wrote down, and then I'll also have some of my sources in um in the description of the video. So hope hopefully I can shed light on you know how legendary Audrey Solomon was. You know just. In my opinion, he really, um, he was the, he was the innovator during the mid '50s, especially for prestige, because he recorded so many legendary albums that you know most people don't even think of when you think of prestige. Uh, a lot of stuff with Mal Waldron, but I'm just gonna get right into it, and I'm gonna start with the beginning. So, Idris Solomon was born Leonard Graham on August 7th, 1923 in St. Petersburg, Florida, but he later changed his name to Audrey Suleiman after he converted to Islam, which was kind of a common occurrence in my opinion around that time, especially for um, jazz musicians. Like you had uh, Yassif Latif, he changed his name. You had, um, uh, you had um, Sabib Habib, or Sabib Shibib, I, I think that's how you pronounce his name. But, you know, this was a common occurrence. It's not like it was just a few people doing this. Um, but I, I feel like it further, um, it further aided them in what they were going for because their music during the 50s and the 60s was not just oriented from bebop. It was also oriented from traditions and cultures, you know, overseas as well. And I think doing that, you know, studying religion and stuff, they were big into this. They, they knew what they were doing, so especially when it came to the music. But where uh, Audrey Silliman, where his musicianship really picked up was at the Boston Conservatory of Music, which is connected to Berklee College of Music. And he studied there with Gigi Grice, which, you know, was, further justifies, you know, his stylistic choices throughout his career because Gigi Grice and Audrey Silliman are really kind of right here as in like in terms of their stylistic choices and you know just everything really and especially the way they write too because you'll be able to see I have some albums here that'll display that but he began his career with Earl Hines otherwise known as Earl Fatha Hines who was a big band leader and I probably attribute to being the chick web of the piano because his um, compositions and, arra and arrangements were very energetic and it, you kind of it's kind of like dance, jazz, you know, of the 30s and the 40s, um, albeit there's not, you know, not really vocals as much as you would see in um, Chick Webb's band with, you know, Ella Fitzgerald, but while Audrey Selman was with Earl Hines, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie were also with Earl Hines for a little bit of time, and that also influenced Audrey Selman to really change his sound. And I feel like every every musician always has that time period where you know they come into contact with an amazing legendary artist like Coltrane. He he played with Bird, and he uh, kind of went on from there, despite you know having um, his drug addiction and all that. They still always kept the music. So, and you'll see in later albums, especially albums on Steeplechase, um, which I have one playing right in the background. Uh, Idris Solomon always called back to them. He did, you know, dedicational songs and albums to just, you know, I guess for his gratitude towards, you know, these legendary artists, the creators of bebop. So his first, I'd say professional appearance on a record date was Thelonious Monk's debut for Blue Note, which was in 1947 on a 78 record. And it was later re-released or reissued, you could say, on um, Thelonious Monk's 10-inch uh, volume one, Gen the Thelonious Monk Genius of, or the Genius of Thelonious Monk volume one, there we go. And then after that, he then appeared in 1953 with uh, Thelonious, I mean not Thelonious Monk's, uh, the Max Roach Quartet featuring Hank Mobley. 
because Max Roach did a few albums for debut records and that was one of them but it's you know every single one of them is ridiculously hard to find it's been on my um, want list for a while but I kind of have given up now I mean you can listen to that stuff on YouTube too so after that he also did another album in 1953 which was Clifford Brown's memorial album and it wasn't necessarily meant for this release because this release has two sessions combined with two different lineups um, I think uh, Audrey Selman's on the B side, yep, and he appears with um, Clifford Brown, Gigi Grice, Benny Golson, Oscar Estelle, Herb Mullins, who I'm not entirely familiar with, and then um, Tad Dameron, Percy Heath, Philly Joe. I mean, Tad Dameron was really inspirational to um, Audrey Selman, but also one of Audrey Selman's um, great friends, Don, uh, Don Sickler, who I'll get into later in the video. But this is the second... 1953 album or 1953 session I could say that uh, Audrey Shulman appeared on so I just love this album I love Clifford Brown two of the greatest trumpet players on you know on one album I mean what, cor what more could you need this is my reissue the original had the um the um what do you call it I forget what was in the back it was like a park in the background and it had the blue cover uh, but anyway this is my reissue so no deep groove or anything but still on the yellow fireworks label so then from 1953 it went to 1956 um, and then he did mal 1 which is in 56 and then mal 2 which is also in 57 and you'll kind of see that these dates and these albums are kind of spread around throughout this video because you know, there's not a lot of um, set in stone release dates to really pick up from online. It's really more so, um, I mean, I didn't mean release dates, I meant recording dates, but there's, there's just, excuse me, there's just release dates online, so. But anyway, 56 was Mal 1, 57 was Mal 2. This is just so innovative, especially for the time period. Especially Mal 1, I mean, 1956 was definitely like, you know, bebop, you know they were swinging and stuff but Mal 1 is far out in my opinion at least for 1956 I mean that first track yesterday's the song structure is definitely different than any other song structure I've heard throughout that year and you know there's a lot of other stuff going on I mean there there was innovative stuff going on you had Hank Mobley doing a lot of stuff on Prestige but then Mal Waldron in my opinion he was really the innovator of the mid 50s on the Prestige label and he always had these unique lineups too as well. Idris Solomon appeared on both Mal 1 and 2 with um, Jackie McLean was on 2 and then Coltrane was on 2 as well. I can't recall who was on 1 because that was more of a... Um, I would honestly say that that concept of that album was an experimental album just with the kind of players on there. But I think that having Idris Solomon on there really... Um, it, it was... Uh, I guess... Mal Waldron saw that and he took him up and had him on a lot of other dates. So after Mal 1 and 2, then I have here um, Interplay for Two Trumpets and Two Tenors, which is basically a prestige all-star album, but it was led by Mal Waldron, which, you know, just like Mal 1 and 2, you, you can suspect that this is just as good. My favorite track on here is Soul Eyes, which is a 17-minute ballad, which lets Idris Solomon have room, space to uh, solo and you know express his stylistic, um, really his choices overall because he would take these long solos. It was almost like Coltrane in 59 and 58, but I, I in my, this is my opinion, I'm sure people would argue with me, but I feel like Idris Solomon at this time, 57 and 58, I feel like he was above um, Miles Davis to an extent, but then you know Miles Davis came came back up in my opinion um, with Kind of Blue and his also his stuff that was released on Prestige, you know, with his um, quintet. So this is uh, this is definitely just some crazy stuff here. And Audrey Solomon is definitely underrated when you think about you know how unknown this album is. I mean, there's not a lot of once on Discogs. I don't have the original. This is my OJC copy. I lost like five auctions for the original and probably with you know probably for good reason because I didn't need to spend that kind of money when I could just spend $20 on a great reissue so and I think this is a digital 
sourced uh, OJC because it's 292. Um, I think that stopped in the maybe 180 or 270. Someone commented on one of my videos a couple um, months ago and told me that. So I don't think this is coming from the tapes on this one. So then also in 1957, we have the Hawk Flies High, which is definitely an unexpected collaboration in my opinion. Coleman Hawkins and Audrey Solomon, definitely, um, I've said this before in other videos, but like you had Coltrane and Duke Ellington, it's kind of like opposites attract. Um, I would probably be, probably explain Audrey Solomon's style as like crunchy, yet, you know, it's, it's driven, but Coleman Hawkins style is, you know, it's kind of brash, delicate. Um, you kind of get a sense of his emotions throughout, throughout his playing. But Idris Solomon, I feel like early in his career, he was definitely doing a lot of stuff um, more powerful and, and on the energetic side. But this is just an amazing album. This is my original on the white label on Riverside. And um, just some amazing stuff here. So then the other ones that I have, also 1957, are Blakey's Big Band. This is a reissue. And, um, you know, got Coltrane on here, Donald Byrd, um, Al Cohn, Bill Hardman, who was kind of similar in style to um, Idris Solomon, and then a few other great people. And then Sabib, Shabib, also appears on here too, like I mentioned earlier in the video. This is a reissue on Bethlehem. Like I said, the original had the orange cover, and then it was the background of them all in the, in the room, the big band. So I just love this record. You can get all the tracks on a CD because this only has a few of the tracks, although still a lot. But you can get all the tracks on a, a reissued CD called uh, The Outer World. It's attributed to Coltrane, but it's not Coltrane. It's Art Blakey. It's just like an un, uh, unofficial CD for Coltrane. It just has all the takes for um, that session. So if you you know if you want all that, then you can get the CD. And then also for 1957, we have the the Cats, which is on New Jazz, a sub-label to Prestige, and this is 8217. This is probably one of my favorites on New Jazz, and I would probably say that the leader of this was Tommy Flanagan. I, I think that was a rumor. I'm not entirely sure how true that is. You can co correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but Tommy Flanagan, Coltrane, Audrey Sullivan, and then um, Kenny Burrell, which Kenny Burrell did um, a string of albums with uh, Audrey Sullivan and Coltrane, and I think this is probably one of the best. Um, this and uh, interplay for two trumpets and two tenors so and there's definitely a, a good mix on there of slow ballads but also fast energetic bop songs so but aside from the records that I do have I want to discuss some of the records that I don't have and where they fit in like on the time period of uh, his recording and his discography so his first as a leader was Three Trumpets, which was with Donald Byrd and Art Farmer, and that was in 1957. That I don't have that, but you know, it's not even talked about that much. I don't think there's an OJC of it. I really want one, but he wasn't really a leader on there, but I guess you could say he co-led. So then after that, you had two, Interplay for Two Trumpets and Two Tenors, and then Roots for Prestige All-Stars, which was also in 1957, and that's another very, very underrated album. Uh, definitely hard to find too as well. I think Mal Waldron's on that too as well. Um, you can definitely tell based on the styles of these albums. And then um, he did two albums with Gene Ammons, Jammin' and Hi-Fi with Gene Ammons in 57. And then in 58 he did Blue Gene, which I haven't, I'm not too familiar with, honestly. And then he did, um, he did an album with Teddy Charles. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it was called. Uh, it was called Coolin, and that was also on New Jazz in 1957. The um, the cover has like, it's like a pool of people. People are all like dancing around in the pool or something. It's like a blue cover. Definitely a, a neat um, neat cover choice. Most of these that I've shown so far have, you know, the covers have been done by Reed Miles, who is just in another, like he's another class of um, artistry like not even music, just his style of art and everything. But anyway, then um, he also did some stuff with Lester Young from 51 to 56 for Storyville. 
Uh, he did something with Ernie Wilkins, who I'm not I'm not familiar with him either. Uh, he did a record with him called Top Brass for Savoy, which is definitely fitting. And then um, a record with w Randy Weston called Little Niles for United Artists in 1958, which I'll later be uh, referring to Randy Weston later in the video. And then, um, then it looks like it, that's all we have for the 50s. But after the 50s, in the early 60s, he moved to Stockholm with uh, Don Bias, Eric Dolphy, and Bud Powell. And you know, that's just so surprising to me because I never knew that uh, Bud Powell, I never knew what he was doing uh, during the mid 60s, but he went overseas with them and uh, they moved to Stockholm. And you know, they were just looking for, um, looking for side jobs, anywhere they could get work. So, uh, Audrey Solomon ended up finding work with uh, Kenny Clark of the Modern Jazz Quartet, but it was just Kenny Clark, it wasn't the Modern Jazz Quartet. So it was Kenny Clark and Audrey Solomon and a little bit of a big band going on. And throughout the 60s, uh, they were doing a lot of stuff on MPS, especially in the late 60s. Like, you know, you had um, Nathan Davis doing stuff on MPS, but it was also around the same time that Kenny Clark was doing uh, stuff with uh, Audrey Solomon. And then uh, on occasion, you'd, you'd find um, Audrey Solomon coming back to the United States and doing uh, certain recording dates. Um, definitely later on, like in the early 70s, uh, you have a session with uh, Sabib Shabib uh, from 64 to 70. 71, though, the dates were wrong on that, on that release. And then um, there's another one I have here that he did. Uh, with Thad Jones in 1978, uh, live at the Montmartre, um, a good time was had by all, and that was released on Storyville. And then another one with Carmen McRae, another unexpected collaboration on the label Black Lion, which is kind of interesting because, excuse me, that's his only one that I know of, or at least that I found. I'm pretty sure that, you know, that's it though. But that was released in 1970, and for Carmen McRae to be on Black Lion is definitely surprising to me. But anyway, then um, in the early 70s, he then joined Steeplechase, which was formed out of Denmark in um, 1973 or 72, correct me if I'm wrong. But And then he did three albums with Steeplechase, which were, let's see if I can find them. A lot, like I said, they called back to um, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, here we go. And he was a leader for this. I would say, like, professionally for the first time, this was him as a leader. For, for the first album for Steeplechase, he did Now Is The Time with um, Cedar Walton, Sam Jones, Billy Higgins, which is what I have playing in the background right now. Phenomenal album. I need to get it in my life. Um, that's on Steeplechase. And the second one on Steeplechase is Bird's Grass with Horace Parlin and Niels Henning and then Orsted Pedersen, then Kenny Clark too as well. And I think it's definitely interesting because a couple months ago I found out that Horace Parlin was doing stuff, he did stuff on Steeplechase. Like he did a record with Archie Shep. Um, I forget the name of the album, but you know, it's always surprising. Whenever I dive into these discographies, I always find out that you know the artists that I never knew what they were up to I find out what they were doing and I just think it's it's pretty cool but then the last one he did for Steeplechase which was released in 1985 was also with Horace Parlin and that was called Groovin I don't know who else uh, was I don't know the other sidemen on that album but as far as um, his solo career and his primary career goes it kind of ended on Steeplechase and then uh it kind of took back up with him as a side man again. He appeared on um, Miles Davis's Aurora album for Columbia in 1985, which was, wasn't released until 1989, which I think is that's an, yet another unexpected collaboration. And then um, I have another one that he did. Let's see. The last two that he did. And these are also unexpected. It's something I never would have um, thought of, but like I said earlier in the video, Don Sickler, was, he was a producer for Verve Records. And he actually, um, I, I don't know the true story of you know how all this like played out, 
or anything or how it happened, but Don Sickler was the producer for uh, Ernie Weston's album on Verve, or Randy Weston, not Ernie Weston, Randy Weston's 1991 album on Verve called Spirits of Her Ancestors, which Audrey Silliman appeared on. And like I said, that was in 1991. So that was at the um, latter half of Audrey Silliman's career. He was very much a writer as opposed to a, you know, a musician, like, not a musician, an, a recording artist, you know, at the end of his career. And, you know, his compositions have been said to, uh, you know, just be legendary. And Don Sickler is the only one to have heard his compositions because um, Audrey Silliman would call Don Sickler up on the phone and play some of his compositions for him. But other than that, there's nothing, you know, surrounding his compositions. There's not, they're not out there or anything, not released. I'd love to see that stuff being like unearthed, maybe some um, unreleased recordings from the vault or something like that. But then his last recording session was with Joe Henderson, which is definitely surprising to me because it was Joe Henderson's big band and it was, um, it was only for a few tracks. But after that, like I said, I.G. Solomon didn't really, uh, he didn't really play too much. He didn't record at all, really. And he just, he wrote, you know, he was a genius. And I wish people would realize that. And that's why I'm doing this video. But as far as his discography goes, it ended with uh, Joe Henderson's big band album in 1994. Or 19, it went from 1992 to 1996 with the, it's like a bunch of sessions, but it was released in 1996. So he also did some other stuff all on the side. You know, he did a record with, in 1975 with Dexter Gordon called More Than You Know, which was also on Steeplechase. He had a few um, other records here and there, but I, I basically covered the, the primary ones and some of the best in my opinion. Um, but aside from his discography, it ended with Joe Henderson's big band album, big band CD. So, you know, he's just a legendary artist. I really, I really fell in love with um, his stylistic choices, his stylistic playing from the Mal Waldron albums. And I found the Mal Waldron albums because of Coltrane. So I'm sure that there's a lot of other people out there that have done the same thing. But if you haven't, I definitely recommend, you know, just check out Audrey Sullivan, even if it's his later stuff. He's an amazing artist. He's definitely, um, I personally feel like he inspired other trumpet players like Woody Shaw. They kind of have a crunch to their sound, yet it's still like, it's still driving. It's still, um, it still comes from bebop, still comes from the roots. I mean, he did an album on Prestige called Roots, so he always called back to the people before him. And I think for that, it further immortalized, you know, his, his impact and his legacy in jazz and you know I think for me personally I see him as one of the top trumpeters especially in the mid 50s and one of the by far one of the best innovators on the trumpet and you know it's sad that he's one of the most underrated trumpet players of all time so anyway that's the video um, just want to see if I if I missed anything I don't think I did but like I said, there's not a lot on him. Uh, I guess I, I didn't say when he passed away. He did pass away in 2002, where he was born, St. Petersburg, Florida, when he was just 78 years old. So, I mean, he was playing music right up until his death. Uh, like I said, he was writing and everything. So just an amazing guy. And um, he never really got his true time to shine, in my opinion. And, you know, that was just a common occurrence back then. A lot of artists went overseas to, you know, the work was better over there. They were more accepted. You know, you had artists like Albert Eiler. They weren't accepted here. They went over there. People understood them. That's just how it was back then. So I think for us to at least try and understand them now and, you know, just spread the love and the, the information, teach people, that's, that's what it's all about. So... And I think one of my big focuses is, like at least with my YouTube channel, is that it's not all about the records. You know, it's not about our um, crumbling addictions or anything like that. It's about the music, it's about the story, it's about the artist. So that's what I hope to be doing um, for like further on. Um, I guess I'll call this an artist spotlight. 
so I'll be doing a lot more of these videos, but the first one is Audrey Solomon. So I hope I, I did him justice, and I hope I um, taught, taught you something too as well. So thank you for watching my video.